Father, we are before you again and acknowledge our absolute dependence upon the ministry of the Holy Spirit to take the things of Christ and to reveal them to us. So we do ask you to grant us that spirit of wisdom and revelation and the full knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that we might have the mind of Christ, that we would be able to hear that which we otherwise would hear in the form of words, but not hear the voice, the voice of the Son of God. So we commit this time to you, that you would speak through the foolishness of preaching, that many might be saved, sanctified, and delivered into the fullness of your thought and purpose for this generation. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we continue to consider what it means to be measured and weighed according to Christ, we're finally at Romans 6. If we were to look at the theme and the background, we would need to start at the beginning of Romans and work through, and especially up through chapter 5, of our standing in grace, and what it means for us to be reconciled to God through the death of His Son. In chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, that sets the stage for the identification between two men in history. One man, Adam. One man, Jesus Christ. Our relationship with Him as the last Adam and the second man, which we've noted in 1 Corinthians 15, 45 and 47. Is one of the most theologically pregnant and significant passages in the Word of God to understand our identification truths and what it means for us to be identified with Him and for He to be identified with us. We have the two men in history, the redemption, the righteousness, the life that comes out of the one transgression of Adam, and then we see the full obedience of the one man, Jesus Christ, be made righteous, verse 19. Verse 21, as sin reigned in death, that is, spiritual death resulting in physical death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to, that means goal, eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And the reigning of grace to eternal life, eternal life is mentioned here as the goal, not the beginning. So the goal of sanctification is eternal life. Eternal life is the life of God. It begins at new birth, but in order for grace to reign through righteousness unto eternal life, so the fullness of that divine life that's in Christ becomes our possession in greater degree and measure, then we need to understand what Paul has said in the first five chapters of Romans. And so what is the conclusion in Romans 6? What then shall we say? Are we to continue in sin that grace may increase? The previous passage talks about is when sin increased, then God's grace actually completely overwhelmed the magnitude of man's fall in the grace and the redemption that's in Jesus Christ. So if grace reigns as a result of the increase and the abounding of that sin, and then the abounding work of grace in Jesus Christ, shall we continue in sin? Not sins, but sin. The rule of the sin nature, that grace might increase, away with such a thought emphatically no meganoita the strongest negative in the greek language how shall we who died to sin still live in it notice it doesn't say sins jesus is the one that died for sins but in our identification with him we die to sin because he who knew no sin was made sin in our place that we might become the righteousness of god in him or do you not know the king james says are you ignorant brethren Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? We know the word baptizo was used in the secular world to take a piece of cloth. You could just baptize it into the dye. And when the cloth goes into the dye, the dye goes into the cloth. So there's identification and incorporation. The word baptize has been transliterated. It's not interpreted. Baptism is not interpreting the Greek. So if you interpret it, you would understand it like this. As many as have been incorporated and identified into Christ have been identified and incorporated into his death. It is a term that refers to a spiritual process. This does not happen at water baptism. That's the testimony. This happens at new birth. 1 Corinthians 12, 12, For by one spirit were we all baptized into one body and made to drink of one spirit. That's in 1 Corinthians 12, I think, verse 13. That's incorporation. Therefore, we have been buried. There's the identification when he was buried and put in the tube. He is the last Adam. We're identified, incorporated, and immersed into him. We've been buried with him through baptism into, and actually the Greek would imply, his death. So his death is our death. 
We died in him as a part of the race in Adam. Remember 1 Corinthians 15, 45, he is the last Adam. The entire Adamic race is incorporated into him. Romans 5, 12 and following. He goes on to say, we have been buried with him through baptism into his death in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in kinotes, a new species quality of life. It never existed until the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the only one that could walk in that life as the last Adam, the second man. But no one in the Old Testament had this life. No one. This newness of life is a new creation of life. It wasn't even available until Jesus Christ as the second man was raised from the dead. And the Holy Spirit was sent from heaven to impart that life to us as the Christian life. Jesus Christ in resurrection is the Christian life. The reference here is newness of life. And the manner and way in which that life is imparted to us is found in Romans 7, 6, where it says, But now we have been released from the law, having died to that. That would be to the rule of the law, or the pronoun could also be translated this way, having died to him, the first husband, Adam, the old man, having died to him, by which we were bound, by law and by sin, so that we serve in newness of the Spirit, and not in oldness of a letter. That newness there, kainotes, is the exact same term that's used in Romans 6.4. It only occurs in those two places. Kainotes means a new quality of life. We are a new creation. How is that realized? That's the position that God has placed us in Christ through the baptism of the Holy Spirit at new birth. So how is that going to be realized? There's going to be a progressive outworking of that. Verse 5 extends that into the experience. For if we have become sumfutas, organically grown together with him in the likeness of his death, this is experiential, certainly we shall also, and you supply the term, be united with him or grown together in the likeness of his resurrection. If we have become, it's actually a perfect tense here. And that emphasizes a state and condition, but the verb to be means it's a process. And the process is to lead us to a state and condition of being organically grown together in the likeness of his death. And the consequence of that is being organically grown together in the likeness of his resurrection. Sumfutos means innate, it's congenital, it's consubstantial. In other words, the life of the vine and the life of the branches becomes so one you cannot tell where the branch leaves off and the vine begins. It's there. Christ is the head. He is the God-man. But in nature and who he is as the Christ, it's one innate, congenital, consubstantial bond in who he is as the last Adam and the second man. This is organic. I used this illustration years ago when I went to Grace Bible College in Grand Rapids, Michigan many years ago. There was a man by the name of C.F. Baker there one of the most godly, wonderful men. He wrote a systematic theology. And his wife, they were just a lovely couple. And they spent a lot of time reading the Word together. He was so full of grace. And he taught the advanced theology course. And I was able to qualify to go into the advanced theology, which I got straight A's in, by the grace of God. But when I met his wife, I looked at him, and I looked at her, and their physiognomy, that is their phenome, how they appeared. They looked the same. They had similar features. But if you look at them when they got married, they didn't look like that. So what happened through the years? Gradually, the one flesh union, spirit, soul, and body, the actual physical appearance began to be merged and manifest. Still the distinction, but it was amazing. And I've seen it in others. I remember an old Nazarene couple years ago when I was living in Sumner, Washington. Very godly people. They had similar appearance. They just knew what the other person was thinking. We'd just talk and synchronize. One would say this and the other say that, just effortlessly. There was just that consubstantial, that coessential merging of one flesh. God's goal is to bring us into the Christ life, the Christ nature, so that when we stand before the Bema, everything is according to Christ. And when everything is according to Christ, when that fire passes around and over and through us, it's all gold. Gold and precious stones. There's no silver, because silver is redemption that's already passed. You don't find any silver in Revelation 21 and 22. It's gold, precious stones, and of course the pearl. 
That's a tremendous thing to think about this term united, grown together. Knowing that the old man, singular, to which we all belong and which characterizes all of us, the old man, singular, of us, plural, was co-crucified with him 2,000 years ago on that cross, that the body of or ruled and governed and characterized by sin, the root of all sins, might be rendered inoperative, caught our go, unemployed, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died, aorist tense, looking back to the cross, is pronounced and declared righteous from the rule of sin, perfect tense, a fact accomplished with abiding results. This is the outworking of what we see in Romans 6, 4 in terms of our position, our identification, the outworking being grown together in the likeness of his death. Then he goes on to say, now if we have died with Christ, and we have, that's a first class condition, if, and we have, if we have died with Christ by our identification with him and his death, we believe that we shall also live with him. This subtle work of the enemy would want to have us think that that's all future. But Paul's mind is that living is beginning now. Living with him now is far more important for understanding this passage and think about we shall live with him and think of it in terms of a future resurrection. Although that's true. That's not what the Spirit of God is saying here. We believe that we shall live with soon him. The soon is the preposition in fellowship with him. That's now. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, never to die again, death no longer is master, exercises lordship over him. For the death that he died, aorist tense, in time, he died to sin. He was made sin in our place. He died to sin once and for all. But the life that he now present tense lives, he present tense lives to God. And that life is the Christian life. That is the Christian life. That's what's in the mind of the Spirit. That's what Paul wants us to understand here. This is the Christian life. This is living together with him. Verse 8. Even so, notice, aorist tenses, he died to sin once for all, in order that present tense, the life that he now lives in resurrection union with the Father as the glorified Son of Man, he lives that life to God. If that life is alive to God in us, then we are living a life to God. This is consecration. This is a life separated unto the Father because that life that He lives to God, if it's reigning in us, our life is living to God exclusively and everything that pleases Him, that is first and foremost on our mind. We don't have any vocation here. Everything we do to earn money is avocation, and everything that we do in terms of living to Him is our vocation, and it has eternity in view. And it has the body and bride of Christ in view, and the place in which God seeks to have realized in the body and bride of Christ. And that's the only reason why we work with SRIDID, is so God can have His place. We don't do it because we like it, we're interested, or is this something novel, or we can boast about it. No, it's so that God can have his place because that humanity is released from death and can come forward into life and be integrated so God has a vessel to possess. God wants God-possessed people. And when we're possessed by God, that's when our will is truly free. When you're possessed by a demon, your will is completely rendered passive and you're under control. When you're possessed by God, only then are you free. Possessed. So it's not just demon-possession we have to think about. What does it mean to be a God-possessed, redeemed person of God? It means that the life that he lives to God is our life. Verse 11, so even so, adding up all these facts and coming to a logical conclusion yourselves to be dead to sin, that's present tense, to go on in your life, be being dead to sin. But go on, be, being, characterized as those alive to God in Christ Jesus, who right now lives to God. So Jesus is the Christian life. Romans chapter 5, verse 10, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, it is much more certain, and to be expected, having been reconciled through the death of his Son, we shall be saved in and by and through his life. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey its lust, and do not go on presenting the members of your body as sin as weapons. That's what the Greek says. Weapons. Sin is a weapon. 
Satan understands this. You want to yield your body to sin? Then you've just handed your body over to Satan to turn you into a weapon against the people of God and against yourself. You want to mess around with sin? You are now weaponized every time you choose to sin. Do not go on presenting the members of your body as weapons of unrighteousness. And what is the number one characteristic way in which the body is a weapon of unrighteous? Sexual sin. That's the number one issue in the New Testament. Number one. The tongue, James, the use of the tongue, a weapon of unrighteousness. But present, eris tense, do this now, do not hesitate. Present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as weapons of righteousness to God. Now that's the normal Christian life. If we extend this out and just take a little pause here and think about this on a corporate level and an eschatological level. That is, what is this going to look like at the end? Is it possible for the body and bride of Christ before rapture to become such a weapon of righteousness that God, through the body of Christ, brings us aids to a conclusion and Satan is displaced and is cast out of heaven, ultimately? Do you think what I just said Satan understands? He knows this. If you read that latest posting under articles in Teos and Sparks, Coming to Zion, you read that, and this will dilate, and we will look at this on Wednesday, this will dilate what I believe the Lord wants us to focus on. Weapons. If we are more and more growing into his likeness, being conformed to that image, Galatians 4.19, Christ being formed in us, morpho essential formness so what is seen on the outside is a result of that actual conformity that's going on on the inside then more and more that righteousness is being displayed this issue of righteousness which we focus on and we'll come back and read the entire chapter at another time i don't even know if we'll get to it today we'll see but right here on this weapons of righteousness It comes out of a consubstantial, coessential, congenital, innate, organic growing together in the likeness of his death. Do we accept that? Do we understand that what we are by nature in Adam, what the Bible describes as the flesh, flesh is defined at its root, sin in the singular, or the old man that is crucified with Christ on the cross. Do we understand what we are by nature if we are operating in that? If that's coming out, not just the bad, ugly, sinful flesh, but the self-righteous, natural man and the intellect that's not crucified, if it's not coming out from Christ, it's utterly useless and dead to God. All that we are apart from Christ is crucified, dead, and buried. And so the Holy Spirit working in us is going to keep conforming us to his death, Philippians 3, 9 through 11, in order that we might attain the out-resurrection from the dead while still in a mortal body. That's the goal. And once the church has reached the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, Ephesians 4.13, and we are raptured, God has a weapon that Jesus Christ will wear to completely destroy all the armies of Antichrist. Revelation 6-19, through 19, Jesus Christ comes back clothed in his bride, He's indwelling his bride and he manifests who he is as the one who is filled with fury and rage and will destroy all of his enemies in and through the glorified church. Do you like that? Is that a feel good thing? Or you say, oh gosh, I didn't know God was that way. That sounds kind of violent. Oh, you don't know what violence is. (laughs) If you haven't read the prophets, you're just in kindergarten. If you don't understand the God of the prophets, you are anemic when it comes to understanding the righteousness of God. You're anemic. And you can't afford to be that. Truth and righteousness are the characterological features that represent weapons. And then, as that comes in love, there's no bifurcation or contradiction between love and mercy and righteousness and truth because they come out of one unified singularity essence of God. God's essence is uncompounded. It's a unified essence. And that essence manifests itself in different ways based upon the character of that person that is being manifest towards The characterological conformity to the image of Jesus Christ is just a huge issue. Being a weapon. Jesus, was he a weapon here on earth? He was being constituted as the last Adam and the second man. 
but he was being constituted to become a weapon. And now Jesus Christ in his people, is he going to ultimately weaponize the body bride of Christ to be an instrument of judgment? Yes, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 2 and 3. Know you not that the saints will judge the world and the saints will judge angels? What's that going to look like? Colossians 3, 1 through 4, that when Christ is manifested, he becomes visible. When that unveiling comes and he becomes manifested, then we will be manifested in fellowship with him in the glory. So the manifestation of Jesus Christ in his glory is the manifestation comes in and through the manifestation of the saints. Isaiah 49, to think about who Jesus Christ is in the incarnation is someone who is weaponized by God in his humanity. Might sound strange to some of you. That weaponization came at infinite cost. He chose righteousness every day as man. He didn't come to do his will. I came only to do the will of my Father. And we know from Hebrews 10, Sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. Lo, I have come. It's written in the volume of books. To do your will. And every one of us are in different capacities and understanding of what it means for that will to be accomplished and for that will that has already been perfected to him to become our will. That growing together so that when we wake up in the morning, whatever we're doing, that our bodies are so available to him as a living sacrifice that we begin to be conscious that there's one who indwells us who has done the will of God, who's perfected the will of God, and the Holy Spirit has come to perfect that perfected will in us through our faith and obedience. Jesus and his humanity, there's a prophecy here in Isaiah 49, listen to me, O islands, that would be the remotest parts of the world from Israel, which is Ezekiel 5.5, 5, the navel of the earth, it's the center. Israel is the center of nations, Jerusalem is the center of Israel, and the Temple Mount is the center of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem, as you read that article, Coming to Zion, is the city But the center and the high point of Jerusalem is Mount Zion. Mount Zion and Jerusalem are often juxtaposed throughout the Bible, but Jerusalem is the general reference to the city of God. But Zion is the high place. That is the place of victory. That is the dwelling place of God. That is his habitation forever when it comes to the spiritual counterpart of that that we see in Hebrews chapter 12. You have come to Mount Zion. That's not here on earth. Okay? But we know from Isaiah 2, 1 to 4, that when Jesus comes back, he will rule on this earth from the actual physical Mount Zion here on earth. So here he is. The Spirit is speaking. Pay attention, you peoples from afar, you Gentiles. The Lord has called me Messiah from the womb. From the body of my mother, he named me. And he has made my mouth like a sharp sword. How, where have you seen that before? Revelation chapter 1, out of his mouth comes a sharp two-edged sword. Revelation 1. How about Revelation 19? When he returns, he slays the armies of Antichrist. Literally, he slaughters them with a sword coming out of his mouth. It means slaughter. He comes back and there's blood all over his garments. He just got through killing off all the descendants of Esau in Isaiah 63. So we may not like to hear that, but this is what it is. When God's justice is released... It comes like a mighty pent-up stream bursting its banks. And that gives me consolation in the level of evil that I've seen in my lifetime and see almost on a daily basis. I sometimes live in the rage of God. You say, well, does God have rage? Read your Bible. Read it. And thank God we can't touch it. If we were to even get anywhere near the mid-center of that rage, we would be consumed. We could not handle it. But there is a level of consecration and sanctification where you come into that rage and that is expressed in terms of indignation of what the enemy has done to God's people. And to be passive or not act on that, there's something wrong with your consecration if you're not acting in that which represents the indignation of God against what the enemy has done to God's people. In other words, if you're a Laodicean Christian, it's time to wake up. So here he is. Jesus says that my mouth is like a sharp sword. You just heard just a faint little echo of something that's sharp in the shadow of his hand. 
as he governed my life and protected my life as Messiah here on earth, he has concealed me. He was seen by people every day. Isaiah 53, they didn't even recognize him. He came into his own, his own received him not, but to as many as received him. To them he gave the legal right to become the children of God, even those who believe in his name, John 1, 11 and 12. He concealed me. They could not fully understand that this is the glory of the Godhead veiled in human flesh. He has also made me a sharpened, literally, arrow. Now what are arrows for in the Old Testament? They're used to kill the enemy. Arrow is no good unless it's employed to kill the enemies. He's made me a sharp arrow. Do you want to take that literally or do you want to just kind of make it a metaphor and kind of spiritualize it? A sharp arrow means God's going to do some killing. Okay? Now, between Pentecost and the rapture, we don't see that sharp arrow. But it's there. It's in him. He is the arrow of God. He has made me a select arrow, but during the incarnation, he has hidden me in his quiver. The quiver is the humanity of Jesus Christ in his unglorified state. It's a quiver. Now, what happened in the resurrection? The arrow is out. There's no more quiver. He's glorified at the right hand of the Father. And now, that quiver, where he is hidden, is in the body and bride of Christ. But when the church, the body and bride of Christ, reach that place of the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ, the weapon who Jesus Christ is against all the nations, fallen angels, when that weapon is released, God will lay waste through Jesus Christ, through members of his body, he will destroy his enemies. Know you not, saints, that you will judge the world. Know you not that you will judge angels. 1 Corinthians 6, 2 and 3. Does that excite you? This is shouting ground, you know? Judge angels. So you look at Revelation chapter 6 through 18, all that that was going on. There's judgment going on, you see. And we're an integral part of that. In the Celestial Court series, we cover that. He said to me, God the Father said to me, Messiah, you are my servant, Israel. He's the ideal Israel. He came to his own people, his own received him not. So Israel as a nation failed to fulfill who they are as a prince with God. They remain, even till this day, Jacob. They haven't attained the status of Israel. That will come at the second advent of Jesus Christ when he rules the reign of the millennium. They will be exalted as the head of the nations. They will be the Israel of God. But Jesus is the prototype. He's the template Israel in whom I will show my glory. But I said, I have toiled in vain. That's his perspective here before glorification. I've spent my strength for nothing and vanity, yet surely justice. That is the vindication that comes from the righteous judgment of God is with the Lord. And my reward is with my God. This is Messiah speaking. Even my Bible has these pronouns, caps. Isaiah 59. The whole chapter is just God's indictment of the nation of Israel for their wickedness, their apostasy, and the condition that they had entered into because of their transgressions and their iniquities. Verse 13, they're transgressing and denying the Lord. They're turning away from our God, speaking oppression, revolt, conceiving in and uttering from the heart lying words. And then verse 14, and justice is turned back and righteousness stands far away. And truth has stumbled in the street and uprightness cannot enter. Yes, truth is lacking. Truth, Emmet, means truth and all that involves truth, faithfulness, integrity. Truth is lacking, and he who turns aside from evil makes himself a prey. They end up being martyred often. Isaiah was martyred. According to one of the extra-biblical records, he was sawn in two under the reign of Manasseh. He was martyred, Isaiah. Now the Lord saw, and it was displeasing in his sight, literally evil, and there was no justice. He saw that there was no man. Individually, Jesus is that man. Corporately, the church is the one new man. And since we are joined with the Lord one spirit, 1 Corinthians 6, 17 or 18, joined the Lord one spirit, that means that the neshama of Jesus Christ, who is the third person, the Trinity, that we are so integrated into this formation of the one new man that when Jesus Christ returns as the corporate one new man, he is going to lay waste everything that is opposed to the kingdom of God and the Antichrist is going to be destroyed, it's going to be a massive slaughter. 
And that judgment is going to be passing through a glorified church. As that judgment of God through Jesus Christ, whom the Father committed all judgment to in John chapter 5, then that judgment passes through. There will be different members that make up this corporate body of Christ. They will have passed through experiences that represent the sufferings of Christ in the body of Christ on earth in time, and their vindication will occur and will be clearly manifested when he's manifested in his saints, and that wrath of God is being poured out on the nations, and that wrath is coming from God the Father through Jesus Christ, expressed through the body and bride of Christ. There will be those that represent the righteous suffering with Jesus Christ on earth in time that will be so weaponized that all the enemies of God will not only experience the wrath of God, but they will experience the vindication of everyone in the body of Christ in time that suffered unjustly under the hand of the enemy. Hallelujah! Amen. Wake up! That's huge! And we haven't even got to this yet. We haven't even got to what the Lord awakened me in this morning and began to unfold. He saw there was no man and was astonished that there was no one to intercede. Intercede means prolonged and travailing prayer so that you're engaged with what God is engaged with and now He can begin to employ you and you can begin to be synchronized with Him in such a way that His will is done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, no Laodicea here. There's no one to intercede, to stand in the gap, to represent the Lord. Then His own arm brought salvation to Him. That salvation came to the whole world on the cross. And his righteousness upheld him. Sustained by righteousness. And he put on righteousness like a breastplate. This is the passage that Paul is referring to in Ephesians 6. Put on the full armor of God. Jesus put on righteousness like a breastplate. His whole humanity when he walked this earth from birth to the time he went to the cross, he was putting on righteousness. To obeying the Father. And now we're to put on righteousness as the saints, Ephesians 6. And as that righteousness comes on as a breastplate to protect our heart from the accusation of the enemy, and the helmet of salvation on his head in the New Testament, that helmet of salvation is eschatological salvation. We're not going to go through the day of the Lord. And there's heretics out there saying the church is going to go through the day of the Lord. This is heresy according to Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Rank heresy. Equal in terms of the deception of Satan deceiving Eve in the garden to say that the church will enter the day of the Lord Paul used the same word, ex apatao, there in 2 Thessalonians, deception. The helmet of salvation means final deliverance for the church. And he put on garments of vengeance for clothing. We don't see that yet. Put on garments of vengeance for clothing. The church comes in the full armor of God in Ephesians 6, 10 and following. The vengeance of God incorporated in that vengeance is him taking vengeance upon so many people that I've seen through the years have gone through horrific rituals at the hands of hybrids, the things that I can't even mention, so horrific so defiling, so off the scale God will be vindicating you the enemies of God the principalities of ours are going to experience revenge 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 3 through 7 Revenge. You like the word revenge? God uses it. He's used it. This is kind of a Holy Ghost ab reaction for me today. After last week. Okay? I don't know what you go through at the hands of the enemy. If I go through the hands of the enemy and I see what happens to my wife and I see what happens to us, I want to make him bleed. Take the fight to him. Never let the enemy bring the fight to you. You take the fight to him. Put on garments of vengeance for clothing. We're still waiting for that. We don't take any kind of vengeance on our enemies now. We bless those who curse us. We walk in the lamb nature before our enemies. This is the shaping and the forming of Christ in us as the wife of the lamb. And he wrapped himself with zeal as a mantle. What's zeal? Well, you're certainly not passive when it comes to the will of God. I mean, you're quite energetic about seeing the will of God accomplished in this generation. Zeal. It's a wonderful word. According to their deeds, so he will repay. Wrath to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. That's payback. To the coastlands, he will make a recompense. That is, they're going to pay. Justice is going to be meted. 
So they, all of mankind, under the judgment of God, will fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun, that is, from the east. For he will come like a narrow, pent-up stream, which the wind of the Lord drives. Or some translation has, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord will lift up a banner, a banner of victory, of conquest. He has a banner. And a redeemer will come to Zion, that second advent, and those who turn away from transgression in Jacob, there's your remnant, declares Yahweh. Now, there's something going on in the body of Christ right now. Preparation, preparation, preparation. We know that at new birth, from several passages, so you can see this before we turn to some other passages, in 1 Corinthians, the one who is joined to the Lord is one spirit. That's 1 Corinthians 6.17. The one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. At new birth, we are joined with the Lord. That word join is the same word that would be the Greek translation of Adam and Eve. He cleaved to his wife. They became one flesh. It's the one flesh union. It includes sexual union. But it is a one flesh union. The one who goes on joining himself to the Lord that is in a spiritual oneness, that's that innate, consubstantial union that we see in Romans 6, 5. That process of being grown together in the likeness of his death in order that we might be grown together in the likeness of his resurrection. So the one who joins himself with the Lord is one spirit. That's something that we do. In contrast to being involved in immorality, joining our bodies to that which is an unholy alliance. That's the contrast here. So the one who joins himself, the Lord, one spirit. One spirit? Now God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. We are created spirit, soul, and body. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And God, he took the dust from the ground, the Adama, the red earth, and he formed. He actually constructed an organic body. It's not alive, but it's organic. It's all there. And then he breathed into that entity, the breath of lives, and he became a living soul. Whose breath is it? It's the Lord's. The neshama is the Lord's. How do we know that? Proverbs 20, verse 27. Your Bible says spirit, but in Proverbs 20, 27. The neshama in a man is the lamp of Yahweh, searching all the innermost parts of a man's being. And when I discovered that working with SRADID, it was a game changer. When I knew how to identify that and recognize that with people and train them on how to respond to that area, we always bypassed programming. We always went around it. And when you can't get to it, it's because they've been to a ritual and that's been taken into death. There's something in the will that's in alignment with Satan that's not allowing that Neshama to be released. That's what I do to talk to and give an ultimatum. And people don't like that. They want to treat these people as victims. But if you can't get to Neshama, they're called active. So what is the Neshama? It's the lamp of the Lord, Proverbs 20, 27. We're going to get something on this because God has Neshama. And that Neshama, friends, is going to be weaponized. And it's going to be turned into a sword, an arrow of the Lord. So how important is it for Satan to capture Neshama since he already knows it's going to be a weapon to destroy him? Neshama. Just a brief review of what is Neshama and how that is defined. That would be in Job chapter 32. I won't read the whole section, but Eli is speaking. In terms of Elihu speaking, he doesn't have the experience of Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, but he makes it very clear that he waited until those who are more advanced in age, more experienced, that they should speak first. Verse 7. But it is the Ruach in man. Spirit. Greek would be pneuma. It's the Ruach in man. And the and there could be even. So there's a very close relationship. But I think the core of the spirit of man can be further defined as the Neshama of the Almighty gives them understanding. So the genitive there is genitive of possession. It's the breath of the Almighty. So at new birth, we receive this animating life force, life essence, Neshama. It belongs to the Almighty. Almighty? You mean the Neshama 
has something to do with Almighty? Wow. And we're being weaponized? Well, if we're yielding our members those weapons of righteousness, yes, if you're out there involved with unclean acts or living in the flesh and pursuing that which is completely outside the will of God, you're a weapon of unrighteousness, you see. It should matter to you because when we're weighed at the Bema seat, it's all going to come out then. Everything is going to go before review in our life. We're going to be weighed in the balances. We are, according to Christ. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.11, we're all going to become manifest in the beam seat of Jesus Christ. He says, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. He's talking to Christians in 2 Corinthians 5.11. Knowing the fear of the Lord. Who's that for? That we're going to stand before the beam seat. You're not going to be judged for sins. That's already done on the cross. This has to do with eternal vocation. This has to do with the measure of the stature of Christ manifest you in a glorified state in eternity. God wants full measure. He wants a hundredfold. So when we stand at the Bema and we don't have a hundredfold, he will say, I had this provision for you. What's your excuse? And so everything that's not according to Christ, the fire comes out of the divine nature and consumes everything that's not according to Christ. And those people, like the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 3, will be saved so as through fire. Nothing. Their whole life on earth wasted. That's the Corinthian state. 1 Corinthians 3, 14 and 15, and 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 14. The Corinthians are equated with the children of Israel in the wilderness. They were killed. They died. They were already redeemed. They died. They were disqualified for the inheritance. This is really serious to me. And you know, when I think about it, I don't allow myself to think about how it's heard because then you want to try to govern things and trying to tone it down. If you speak to please the audience of one, you don't have to be concerned about how are the people hearing. What does God want to hear? That's what matters to me. What does he want to hear? And you get to the point where you don't care what man thinks. Because if you care, you lack spiritual backbone. The breath of the Almighty gives them, in the Hebrew, is discernment. Well, I just don't know. Really? You do too know. Don't tell me you don't know when you're talking to survivors. I don't know. That's programming. That's protection. You do know. I wouldn't say it like that. They'd be terrified. They'd shut down. You know. They do know. Say softly. They do know. And by the way, when I'm doing an assessment, someone, they say, I don't know three times. They say, you're not ready to work with me. You're in protection. You're probably called active. So I just shut it down. People don't like me after that. But they come back years later and they say, well, you're right. How do I know I'm right? I have a book that tells me how to think about these things. And the Spirit of God, through the book, tells us how to think. The Neshama gives understanding. And the word in the Hebrew is discernment. If you've been programmed to be a Nephilim, and you get to Neshama, oh, that's just a part of me that was conditioned to believe that. You see? I'm speaking illustrations to those who understand this or IDID. I've lived in it for 30 years, so I don't have a whole lot of other illustrations, okay? So the breath, the Neshama, the Almighty gives him understanding. Satan, does he have any plan to capture Neshama and a person who's generational S or IDID? Does he have it? Yeah. He knows what this is. He understands this. So through death rituals, he's going to do whatever that he can, that he's able to do, to capture that neshama and life essence. In death, that is the way he sequesters this capacity for us to know and to discern. Job 33, verse 4, The Spirit of God has made me, that's Ruach, were created. In verse 4, the neshama of the Almighty gives me life. This is what Satan is after. He's after the life, Job 33, 4. So has he come up with a plan to capture that life? This is S-R-A-D-I-D, to whatever degree the life is not there. Captured between conception and implantation in this whole corporate realm of the body and bride of Christ being hijacked by Satan so that he clothes himself with that stolen life essence so he can have a counterfeit body and bride of Christ. He knows how important it is. So in these death rituals and resuscitation, he siphons off Neshama, siphons off Neshama. And when that's released to the degree that Neshama is released in a person's life, they are integrated. It's not about cognitive therapy, although you may have to go through some of that when you're working with some of the protectors. It's life that the adversary is after. That's the most precious. Proverbs, guard that life. For 
but out of it, your heart, for out of it are the issues of life. You see. Satan's number one strategy is to capture that life, keep it sequestered. That's where the new birth identity is. That's always the deepest buried to keep it there. Why? Because he understands that when in this generation, which is the last generation, when all Neshama captured by death, by Satan in this generation, when it's released, it'll be the weapon of Yahweh. It'll be weaponized. Because every one of you that are being integrated and are integrated, it's because you have life essence has been released. And through that knowing and understanding, you come more and more into unity. There's no need for separate altars because they have a cohesive center. They have an epicenter to become a unified person based upon life, based upon Neshama being released from death. If you know anybody that's SRIDID, if they're still working with altars and parts, and that's all the counselors know, Satan doesn't care how long you work with altars. He could care less. And I don't work with elders. Do I acknowledge them? Of course I do. Once they're up, within a minute, we're past that. Because that altar is not a person. It's a psychological construct created in trauma. So I never treat it like a person. Although I'm personable, because there's something of that which is the person there. You just go right past that. Go right to it. To the core. So, good. What do you do? What did I do this? It's just a function. I'm looking for that little girl that was there in the beginning that you were created off from. How's she doing? Oh, she's dead. Okay, so we just get in there, bring her back to life, and get the essence release. It's that simple. Really. It's that simple. And if there's a little bit of opposition, command the opposition to cease or come into full manifestation. You might have to engage. You might have an exorcism involved, and that's a normal part of the process. Now, what is this Nushama? It is the Nushama of the Almighty. It gives life. Now let's notice something that I did not even discover until this week. As I began to study more about this Neshama, it came through a conversation with a friend, Benjamin, you know who he is, who is a prolific writer and has his own column on uh, News with Views, and he's interviewed on a lot of different programs now. But as we were interacting, he was asking me some questions about Neshama, so I got to thinking about it, so I looked it up again, and the Bible Hub... When you go in and look up the verse in the Hebrew, at the top it says BDB. You can click on BDB, which would be the Brown Driver and Briggs Hebrew Lexicon. I read that and said, this doesn't look right. There was something that was not quite copied or photocopied right. So I went to BDB and pulled it out. And for whatever reason, whatever was scanned in that's on Bible Hub didn't actually represent 100% accuracy of the actual Brown Driver and Briggs Hebrew lexicon, which I purchased this in 1971 in Houston, Texas, I think 1972. Quite expensive back then, too. The new one now that's replaced it in five volumes, it's $800, is the HALD, Hebrew Aramaic Lexicon of the Old Testament. That's the one that's replaced this now, but this is still definitive. So as I begin to look at this, Breath, nashama. The verb, nasham, just means to gently breathe, like a wind. It can be a strong breathing of a woman in travail. So that's the verb. But the noun is a feminine noun. It's built off of the verb, nasham, it's nashama. And there are a number of verses which I'm not going to go through. I mentioned Genesis 2, 7. There's Job 27, 3, Job 34, 14, Isaiah 57, 16. There's three different categorizations of this word. The lexographers have categorized the use of this term in the Hebrew Bible. The number one, the breath of God. Okay, The breath of God is a hot wind kindling a flame. First reference, Isaiah 30, verse 33. When I saw this, I really got excited. I mean, I don't know if you can tell today or not. But, I mean, when I saw this, it's like, <laughs> you think about that illustration in the Old Testament. It says, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Saul and he became another man. That actually says that. He became another man. Well, I think the church is going to need to know what it is for the Spirit of the Lord to come upon them so they become another man, something other than the old man. Isaiah 30. What a passage. We'd have to look at Isaiah 10, Isaiah 14, when we see a prophecy when the Syrian is in the land. Let's go back and look at some of these. Isaiah 14, where we see the term is used. I love this. This is all about the destruction of Babylon and the coming Antichrist. Isaiah 13 and 14. Isaiah 14, verse 24. The Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts, Yahweh Sabaoth, means that God is the commander-in-chief of all fallen angels, elect angels, everything seen and unseen. 
He's an absolute commander in chief of everything. Sovereign. Notice this. Yahweh, the Lord of hosts, has sworn, saying, Surely, just as I have intended, so it has happened. And just as I have planned, so it will stand to break Assyria and my land. Some translations have the Assyrian. And according to A.W. Pink's The Antichrist, it's one of the titles of Antichrist, the Assyrian. Because remember, Nimrod established both Babylon and Assyria. I will break Assyria. Near view, this happened when the Babylonians conquered Assyria. I will break it in my land and I will trample him. Assyria is a nation that was used by God to discipline the northern kingdom, but the him is now the leader. That would be Sennacherib. But prophetically, projecting this into the future, according to A.W. Pink in his book on the Antichrist, this is one of the descriptors of the Antichrist in the Bible. I will trample him, the Assyrian, on my mountains. Wait till you read the book Coming to Zion. The article, I should say. On my mountains. That's the destruction of Antichrist. Revelation 19, many passages. Then his yoke will be removed from them, that is, God's people, and his burden removed from their shoulder. This is the plan devised against the whole earth, and it is the hand stretched out against all the nations. This is majestic, people. When you read the prophets, you're in the presence of majesty, someone in authority, someone who knows what he's talking about, someone who's not confused about anything and not threatened by anything. You know? We'll go to Isaiah 30, verse 27. I'll read through this. Behold, the name of the Lord comes from a remote place. This is eschatological. Isaiah 30, verse 27. Comes from a remote place, from the third heavens, burning in his anger, dance in his smoke, His lips are filled with, you know what the Hebrew says? Cursing. Anathema. Destruction. That's the Hebrew. And his tongue is like a consuming fire. These are majestic statements. This is the Lord. And his breath, that's the Ruach. The third person, the Trinity. As Yahweh, his breath, the Ruach, is like an overflowing torrent which reaches to the neck of his adversaries to shake the nations back and forth in a sieve, to put in the jaws of the peoples the bridle which leads to ruin. Read Second Thessalonians chapter 2. He shall send upon those who reject Jesus Christ a supernatural, energizing, deluding spirit that will lead them to destruction. He lets the deceiver out upon them to deceive them so they can be destroyed. You know what that tells me? You don't need to fear the devil. You better fear God. If he can weaponize the devil to go after those who want to worship the devil and not worship God, and he'll use the devil to deceive and destroy them, it's time to fear God. So anyone that is dabbling with occult stuff and think that you're in some kind of a position of Satan, Satan will ultimately destroy you. You will have songs as in the night when you keep the festival. This is speaking of the Jewish people. And gladness of heart as when one marches the sound of a flute. To go to the mountain of the Lord, to the rock of Israel. This is speaking to the remnant. We see in Zechariah 9-14, through we see in all these remnant passages, God is speaking to a remnant. And this mountain is Mount Zion. And the Lord will cause his voice of authority to be heard. His voice. And the descending of his arm to bring redemption to Israel and destruction to the enemies. And in the flame of a consuming fire. In a cloudburst, downpour hailstones, he's going to commandeer as Yahweh Sabaoth, all of nature, to be instruments of judgment. For at the voice of Yahweh, Assyria will be terrified. By extension, all the nations formed against the Lord and his Christ, Psalm 2, Revelation 19, 19. When he strikes with a rod. Revelation 2, 26 to 28. The very rod of God's judgment that God the Father gives Jesus in Psalm 2 is shared with the overcomer. Revelation 2, 26 to 28. You can look it up yourself. There's the descending of his arm, and in the flame of consuming fire, etc., when he strikes the earth with a rod. Okay, verse 32. And every blow of the rod of punishment, literally every passing of a blow of the staff of foundation. In other words, God is going to expose in the prophets the foundation of everyone's being, of persons and individuals, of nations. 
He's going to lay foundations bare. It's the staff of, it says punishment, that's true, but he's uncovering foundations, is what the Hebrew says. Which the Lord will lay on him will be with the music of tambourines and lyres and in battles and brandishing weapons. He will fight them. Yahweh will fight his enemies. Now watch this. For Tophet, the place of child sacrifice. In the New Testament is referred to as Gehenna. Gehenna is described as the lake of fire. In the Hebrew, that word is traced back to that garbage dump outside of Jerusalem where not only the garbage took place, but where they offered child sacrifice by passing through the fire to Moloch. Tophet has been ready, but not for any more child sacrifices. You were involved with rituals and slaughtering infants. It's being prepared for you. You arrogant sons of Belial. They're still cult active. God says it's prepared for you. Well, what if I'm a believer? Well, what if you're not? If you're a believer, let all those who name the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. That's what the word of God says. Depart from iniquity. Indeed, Tophet, Gehenna, this place that historically is used for child sacrifice, indeed it has been prepared for the king. Excuse me, the king. Near view, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, by telescoping, extension, Antichrist. Isaiah 13, Isaiah 14. It's prepared for Antichrist. He, Yahweh, has made it deep and large. A pyre of fire. That's when you put a body on there and you burn it because they're dead. A pyre of fire with plenty of wood. The Neshama of Yahweh, like a torrent of brimstone, sets it, Gehenna, He is joined with the Lord as one spirit. Now, how is God going to execute this unless all the Nushama that is weaponized, body and bride of Christ, is released? So can we understand the strategic nature of that which represents those that are captured in SRIDID, that their life essence be released from death? Because when that reaches a specific volume, if you could use that metaphor, That which represents the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, God has his weapon in hand. The Neshama of the Lord. What's the Neshama that's in us? It's the Neshama of the Lord. It's the Neshama of the Almighty. And this same Neshama of the Lord is like a torrent, brimstone set on fire. It's weaponized. Do you get that? Can you now understand what SRADID is all about? Satan says, not if I can do something about this. I'm going to steal that Neshama. And I'm going to hold on to it as my most prized and precious possession. Not only when it's released are people integrated, but when it's released in the fullness that completes the one new man of Ephesians 2.15 and the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ is attained and the church is raptured and we pass through the beam of seat, God has his weapon because when he comes back, he's going to come back to be glorified in his church on that day, 2 Thessalonians 1.10. And what's 2 Thessalonians 1.10? Read 2 Thessalonians 1, 3 through 9, and the context is the day of the Lord, God taking vengeance upon his enemies for what his enemies have done to persecute the people of God. And he's going to take vengeance, 2 Thessalonians 1, 9, when he comes back to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be the object of marvel among all those who have believed. That's what it says. The breath of the Lord is like a torrent of brimstone. So as I was studying that again, I got pretty excited. Because, man, I mean, give me a break. I mean, Neshama, I mean, I understood what it was in SRDID counseling, but I didn't understand that God is going to use this as his weapon. A weapon. And all that Neshama carries the record of what you went through in SRDID. It's not about cognitive memory. When you have that, you know what you went through. You know what happened at conception. You know what happened in the womb. That's not cognitive memory. That's Neshama. That's knowing. So all that knowing is going to be united with the glorified Jesus Christ, one spirit. And when he comes back as the judge of the whole earth, he is weaponized because when he comes back, he comes back in the armor of Isaiah 59. He comes back in the full armor of God. That armor that is singular in Isaiah 59 is what we are now putting on. And the commandment there in Ephesians 6 is not given to an individual. It has to be taking place in local companies. You all put on the whole armor of God. 
It means it's done in relationship. It's not done in individuality, although by application you can do that and assume that and you can apply that. But the intent of the passage is as we put that on, we are preparing for the Lord's coming. We're making it possible by our active obedience of putting on that armor there, we are cooperating with God so that when Jesus comes back, he has his church that is his armor. Put it on. Well, in Isaiah 59, Messiah puts it on. In Ephesians, we put it on. Why? Because head and body, 1 Corinthians 12, 12, are called the Christ. When you understand the mystery, which is the key hermeneutic to understanding the entire Bible, when you understand the doctrine of the mystery, the mystery of the Christ... You have the hermeneutic, you have the key that unlocks every scripture in the Bible, every prophecy. You know that you know how to see the landscape of the entire word of God from Genesis to Revelation. Understanding the mystery is the hermeneutic of the entire word of God. There it is. The breath of the Lord is like a torrent of brimstone. Remember Isaiah 57, when he comes, he will come like a mighty pent up stream. Two more verses and we'll bring it to close today. Because I could go on and on with this. 2 Samuel 22.16 is also found in Psalm 18.16. It's the same. Psalm 18 verse 16 is replicated in 2 Samuel 22.16. So it doesn't matter which one. I'm going to turn to Psalm 18. What a psalm this is. Wow. To read it and to see David is a mighty man of valor and just who he is is an instrument in God's hand. Remember, the Holy Spirit says in Acts chapter 13, after God deposed Saul, he raised up David, a man after his own heart, who was willing to do all of God's wills, plural, comprehensively. Verse 36, because he served the will of God in his own generation. We need to be very, very, very alert and keen to what the will of God is in our generation because it's different in every generation. There's interrelated, but there's specificity to this generation. Psalm 18, 16. He sent from on high, David says, because he was in serious trouble. I mean, he was crying out to the Lord. And you read those passages, and God came down. He bowed the heavens and came down, and he delivered his anointed. And it even goes back to creation activity and judgments that are very, very big and immense historically. In verse 16, he sent from on high, he took me, David says, he drew me out of many waters. That is Psalm 69, the waters that Satan released to destroy him and to kill the Lord's anointed. He drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy and from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my stay. He supported me. He brought me forth into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. Let's go back. Verse 15. So that kind of gives you background. Verse 14. God sent out his arrows and he scattered them, my enemies, and lightning flashes in abundance and routed them. This is God's judgment against the enemies of David. And this would be God's enemies against the Lord and his Christ, the Messiah, Psalm 2. Then the channels of water appeared, and the foundations of the world were laid bare. In the great and terrible day of the Lord, that language is used throughout Isaiah 24, 34, and Zephaniah, many passages. The foundations of the world were laid bare. This is in the great and terrible day of the Lord. At thy rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the Nashama of thy nostrils. Weaponized Nashama. So how significant is what God breathes into us at our conception? Adam and his creation, but at our conception, and Satan's number one target is to capture that in death and to keep it. Now we know why. Because Satan understands that this, united with the Lord as the Spirit of the Lord, he was joined with the Lord, one Spirit with the Lord. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. As we come back, whenever he is manifested, we shall be manifested with him in the glory. You see that? This is tremendous. This is really, really good, too. One more verse. I said that we've got to look at one more in the Second Thessalonians, the destruction of the Antichrist. Oh, that hybrid Christ is going down. Oh, it's so good to know this. Revelation 19.19. And he waged war in Revelation 19.20 when Jesus returns. The Antichrist and the false prophet are thrown alive into the lake of fire. They don't even stand before the great white throne judgment. Why? Because they are beasts. When we look at this passage, 
about the coming of the Antichrist in Second Thessalonians, and the mystery of lawlessness is already supernaturally working in Second Thessalonians two seven. Only he who restrains, that's the person of the Holy Spirit and the body and bride of Christ, he will continue to restrain until he, the Holy Spirit, is taken out of the way. That is a rapture. He's taken out of the way as a restrainer. He's not removed as a person because nobody could be saved in the tribulation if the Holy Spirit wasn't here. He's just removed as a restrainer. Psalm 2.3 Then that lawless one, the Antichrist, will be unveiled, apocalypto, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end, render powerless, unemployed, by the flashing forth, the epiphany of his parousia. And we are in the epiphany. Colossians 3, verse 4. We're in the epiphany. The epiphany of Christ is the result of the revelation of Christ. And when the revelation of Christ is manifest, we are manifested with him in the glory. It's a unified corporate organic event. Now let's go back and look at this. The lawless one, Antichrist. And then the lawless one is revealed, whom the Lord will slay with what? Hello? Numa. There's no difference in the Greek. Numa. Neshama. This is the Greek term. Numa. Ruach in the Old Testament. Neshama. How they're interrelated and interconnected. It's just one combined Numa. He's going to slay with the breath of his mouth. Wow. And we see in Revelation chapter 1, there's a sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. What is he doing? He's dividing asunder between Laodicea and Philadelphia. And when he comes to the second advent, we see at the end of Revelation chapter 19, what happens at the end of Armageddon? The sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth is Nishama, spirit. And after the Antichrist is thrown in the lake of fire, Revelation 19.21, all the rest of humanity that represents the armies of Antichrist, Revelation 19.21, the rest were killed with a sword that came from the mouth of him who sat upon the horse and all the birds were filled with their flesh and verse 15 from his mouth comes a sharp sword that's spirit and we are incorporated in that in a glorified state so everyone who chooses to come all the way through from their history of SRIDID you've had to take back Neshama and when you take back Neshama you have all your memories That certainly needs to be qualified. That is true in an absolute sense, but when it comes to the process of a person who is coming out of a history of trauma, there's incremental steps. There's capacity, incremental steps. So as the Neshama is progressively and incrementally released, your history is being rebuilt and your life is coming back, and it is definitely incremental. I've never worked with anyone who, they're totally amnesic, and their Neshama is released, and they're all integrated, and they have all memories, I think they would die. I mean, God just doesn't do that. So the recovery or the release and the retrieval from death of Neshama is definitely incremental. But when that is released, the person is integrated. It tapers at the end. Even when there's no more DID system, is it's still being released. Then there's more capacity for life. There's more of a connection with God. So all the defenses to keep you from knowing just how bad you are, you just settle it up front. You don't have to worry about how bad you are. Just say, well, God, I deserve the lake of fire. So I don't need to hide from anything. That's what I deserve. And grace means, through Jesus Christ, I'll never get what I deserve. Never. I'm the object of mercy. I'm the object of grace. So I can look at anything. Why? Because you, Lord Jesus, who knew no sin, were made sin in my place. In all my afflictions, you were afflicted, Isaiah 63, verse 9. So we don't have to be afraid to see how bad we are. It's worse than you think. And the longer you go on with the Lord, from the experiential perspective, the worse you get. When we were singing the hymn today, just give all our burdens to the Lord, I said, I'm the biggest burden of all. I'm the biggest burden of the world for Lori. And you self-righteous ones, you could say, well, that person over there is your burden. You know what I mean? You're the biggest burden. Come on, we'll open up your eyes and see. Who does God have to endure with the most? The one who lives in your body. You know? Otherwise, you're self-righteous, you see. And so God has to deal with it. He has to circumcise our hearts. We do bless the Lord. We thank Him that His nature and who He is as a spirit being and how we're so intertwined, enmeshed. 
We couldn't be any more enmeshed, grown together in the likeness of his death, that we might be grown together organically in the likeness of his resurrection. And that's not only for sanctification in time. That takes us right on through the beam of seat, right into the second heavens, and Satan being cast down, Revelation 12. When you have that instrument, Lord, when you have the wife of the Lamb, raptured and glorified, you have your weapon in hand, and it will be the sword coming out of your mouth. So we do thank you, Lord, for your word, and that it's, as your psalmist said, your commandments are exceedingly broad. And so we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.